Good evening, everyone. My name is Shelby Strecker, and welcome to part one of Transforming the Conversation. In his book, The Next Christians, Gabe Lyons reports a result of 2011 national survey of more than 1,000 American adults in which 95% report, uh, consider the tone and level in, of incivility, incivility today to be a problem and getting worse. Today, we are living in an argumentative society with a combative mindset that hinders people's ability to tackle important issues effectively, especially complex topics of moral conflict. When faced with moral conflict, people commonly lapse into intractable debate, and the two biggest communication casualties are listening and understanding. As Lyons argues, divisive moral attacks cause us to miss the bigger picture of how God might be moving in our time and laying the groundwork for a better future. The alternative to divisive attack is dialogue. The goal of dialogue is not consensus, but instead it strives for both sides to obtain a new and deeper understanding. Dialogue seeks authentic conversation in a comfortable and safe environment that honors and respects the other. Dialogue does not ask people to compromise their convictions or feel threatened to defend their beliefs. Community is strengthened as both sides work together and learn from one another to develop new meaning. Pepperdine University understands the possibilities of utilizing this method of conversation and is determined to respond with action. In, a 2010, in 2010, Pepperdine formed the Building Bridges Committee to establish a place of open conversation between students and staff in regards to sexual orientation. Each year since then, Pepperdine has had important conversations, including the first Transforming the Conversation program in 2012, featuring tonight's speakers, Ron Belgau and Justin Lee. They've returned tonight to show how dialogue is not only important, but needed, especially with topics like sexual orientation. I'm a communication major, and in my training and development course this semester, my peers and I have had the privilege of working with the student affairs leadership team in creating a moral conflict dialogue training program. Our training consists of three phases, which together is designed to teach and draw on virtues necessary for dialogue on issues of moral conflict. The three phases are, one, starting the conversation with self-examination of worldview and mindfulness. Two, keeping the conversation going while contemplating common humanity with perspective taking, dialogic listening, and narrative. And three, seeking wisdom and restoration using an ethic of empathy, breaking negative scripts and spirals, and reframing with appreciative inquiry. We will present a pilot of this training to the student affairs leadership team in a few weeks, and we hope that the training will be an extension of programs like tonight. We commend Pepperdine's efforts in dialogue, dialogue directing, affecting students, and we're excited to hear now from Ron and Justin as they discuss and demonstrate rules of dialogue in the context of their friendship and an inspiration to help us transform the conversation at Pepperdine. Now we, I'd like to welcome my fellow classmate, Chloe Wright, to lead us in a prayer. Thank you, Shelby. Please join me in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, who art in heaven, blessed be thy name. We give our praise and gratitude to you and ask that you continue to foster and provide enriching opportunities such as these in our lives. May we position ourselves to listen with boldness and courage, both of which we could only attain through your own grace and kindness. May we seek your peace and your patience. May we focus on developing the fruits of our spirit and may these experiences strengthen our dialogic abilities and bring us one step closer to the type of relationship you aspire for us to attain. Through the enablement of our own grace, transform us so that we may enjoy the beauty of transformation. For the only thing we cannot do today is live without you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. That's okay, I don't need it. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> Good evening. Welcome to Transforming the LGBT Conversation. It's a joint effort being the, between the Student Government Association and the Chaplain's Office at Pepperdine. And I think they're both to be commended for bringing us here tonight. So let's go make it So my name's Craig Detweiler. I'm a professor in the Communication Division, and I'll be moderating two nights of conversation featuring two distinguished guests. 
uh, Ron and Justin, who I'll introduce shortly. Uh, tonight, we're interested in practical tips for ending the culture war. Tomorrow night, we're going to put tonight's discussion into practice in regards to biblical interpretation, particularly Paul's letter to the early church in Rome. So tonight, our hopes uh, are that we will be able to cover common misconceptions that each side may have about the other. We might be gracious with our language and avoid the buzzwords that shut down conversations and explore why dialogue is more effective than debate. Can we do that? Can you do that? <laughs> All right, we'll find out. Um, so many churches and denominations have split over these issues. Uh, they've been unable to figure out how to proceed together. Uh, I hope that we will see the best of Pepperdine exhibited uh, in these two nights as we seek the leading of the Holy Spirit rather than the spirit of winning an argument. It's a tumultuous time to host this conversation. Uh, every week there is another headline, another controversy. It might be about Chick-fil-A sandwiches. It might be about <laughs> Duck Dynasty. Uh, there's celebrities, different celebrity coming out as, uh, you know, gay almost every week. It was Ellen Page this week. I don't know who it'll be next week, right? So it's an ongoing thing. Uh, it's, it's headlines that are happening now. In the last uh, year you've had Exodus Inter International Ministries shut down and cease what they were doing for, you know, 20 some years. Um, you've had the uh, passing of Fred Phelps of Westboro Baptist just since this event was announced. Um, I was looking in the New York Times, Ross Duhat had an uh, article where he was sort of announcing the terms of surrender on the gay marriage debate and yet asking who is being discriminated against at this time. Do shop owners have the right to refuse to bake a cake for a, a gay couple's wedding? Or is that a form of prejudice that should be opposed and even outlawed? We are not settled on these issues. And, and we probably won't be settled on them by the end of maybe tomorrow night at <laughs> 9.30, okay? But uh, we have sort of established a little residence hall vibe up here because we hope that this kind of conversation that we have tonight is something you could literally take back to your resident halls and continue. And maybe dare and risk to have that conversation that you've been maybe unsure how to have, to get into some issues that you've maybe been scared to raise. Um, that would be, I think, a, a huge victory um, for all of us. All right, what else? You got these cards, right? You're like, why do I have this card? I think that the hosts of tonight, Chaplain's Office, Student Government Association, would love to know to what degree you might have been transformed by this conversation. What did you learn? What did you hear? What, what might have changed in your thinking? How has your heart or your mind moved? So this is just a way for you to respond to the evening. You also have a way to ask questions and do that uh, throughout the night. Uh, you'll see that later. You can text questions to 433151 and that'll be up there later. Um, now I want to set aside our time so we can focus on our guests. We're going to hear 40 minutes from them. And then we're going to have 40 minutes for conversation. And if you're doing your um, convo credit, you're saying that doesn't add up because that's more than an hour, right? Tough luck. You're in for, for extra convo tonight, right? Congratulations. Mm, they're like, oh, rah. go ahead, leave now. Go ahead, ingrates, go ahead. Somebody else wants your seat. All right. <laughs> Ron Belgau, Belgau received his undergraduate degree at the University of Washington. So how about them Huskies? Yeah. And uh, after working for several years at Microsoft, Ron is now completing the PhD program in philosophy at St. Louis, St. Louis University, where he teaches medical ethics and philosophy of the human person. He also spent a year at the University of Notre Dame at their Center for Philosophy of Religion. And he's been on steering committees for Bridges Across the Divide, the Seattle Archdiocesan, Diocesan. Thanks a lot, man. It's cruel. You can tell you're not Catholic. Right. Uh, <laughs> the Gay and Lesbian Ministry, a group leader for the Multi-Faith Aid Project, leader of the Gay Christian Network's Celibacy Support Forum. And for over a decade, he's traveled across North America speaking at, uh, and about Christian teaching and homosexuality. In his essay, My Alternative Lifestyle, shared first place in the Catholic Press Association's Best Investigative Writing or Analysis category. 
in 2005. You can find his essays and speeches at cityofgod.net. He is joined on stage by his friend. Isn't that odd? We have two friends speaking tonight who might have different opinions about things and different beliefs and even different practices. But these two friends, the second friend is Justin Lee, who received uh, his undergraduate degree from Wake Forest University. How about them demon deacons? <laughs> I've never understood how you could be a Baptist university and your mascot's the demon deacons. But that's a different question you they can address later. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so he's the founder and executive director of the Gay Christian Network, a nonprofit interdenominational organization serving LGBT Christians and those who care about them. Justin grew up in a conservative evangelical household, household preaching against homosexuality until questions about his own sexuality forced him to reevaluate everything he thought he knew. And they'll both be sharing some of their stories and their journeys tonight. Um, He's been featured in numerous print, radio, and television venues, including Dr. Phil, Anderson Cooper, CNN Headline News, Out Magazine, and a front page article in the New York Times. He co-hosts a popular podcast, GCN Radio, and his first book is Torn, Rescuing the Gospel from the Gays versus Christians Debate. Justin es Justin's essays are available at gaychristian.net slash great debate. Let's get that great debate started. Or is it a dialogue? I guess we're going to find out. Come on up. Give the big hand to both these gentlemen. Ron and Justin. It's always good when you start off a presentation by flipping through slides you didn't mean to flip through. So, mm -hmm. Well, good evening. My name is Justin Lee. Um, my friend Ron here. Uh, and I have been friends for a very long time. Oh, thanks. We have been friends for a very long time. We are both committed Christians. And we also have something else in common, which is we both like to talk. <laughs> so the last time we came into the presentation, thank you to five of you who laughed. The, <laughs> the last time we came into the presentation here at Pepperdine, we decided that in order to make sure that we uh, um, allocated our time fairly, we would bring a chess clock. So we did, and we brought the chess clock uh, again, so that every time that one of us finishes speaking, we can hit it and, and the other one uh, can talk. And so this is what we've been doing every time we've spoken. We like to hit it really, really hard. For some reason, tonight it's not working. So, <laughs> so we brought a digital chess clock, <laughs> which I am going to start now. Um, so Ron and I are good friends, as I said. We are both committed Christians. But we strongly disagree on how the church should counsel someone who is attracted to the same sex, specifically when it comes to sexual morality. Ron believes that sex is designed to be between a man and a woman within the confines of marriage. And that any sex outside of that, even in a same-sex union, same-sex marriage, um, is sinful. That's outside of God's will for us. And that's uh, why he believes that gay Christians should commit themselves to celibacy. I disagree with him. I think that uh, gender is not the deciding factor in whether a relationship is moral or immoral. I think that there are moral and immoral sexual relationships. Uh, I think that sex should be within marriage, as Ron does, but I leave marriage open to uh, uh, two people of the same gender as well. So Ron and I disagree pretty strongly on a really significant issue in the church. And tonight, we're going to talk a little bit about that, but tomorrow we're, going to, uh, tomorrow we're going to talk more about why we disagree. Tonight, instead of jumping right into the debate, we want to talk about our stories and how we agree, how two friends who've been friends for many, many years, <laughs> since I was a little boy, <laughs> can still be friends even though as Christians we disagree very strongly on something that affects both of us very personally. So, let me tell you my story first because I got up here first, so nanny nan. <laughs> I grew up actually in a very conservative Christian home. Uh, I grew up Southern Baptist. And uh, yeah, it was exciting. Um, I was... Growing up, I was kind of super Christian. You know, anybody know like a super Christian? 
My nickname in high school was God Boy. <laughs> I was the kid with the Bible in his backpack and a bunch of tracts from church ready to witness to anybody who would listen and a bunch of people who wouldn't. Um, I was always ready to preach at anyone about any controversial issue that I thought Christians should take a stand on and I knew why they were wrong. Maybe some of you knew someone like that in high school. If so, I apologize. Mm. Maybe some of you were that person in high school, mm. in which case, hey. Um, <laughs> I wore Christian t-shirts, I listened to Christian rock music, I played Christian video games. Oh yes. <laughs> yeah, I grew up when the um, original Nintendo was popular and one of the most popular games at the time was The Legend of Zelda. So of course, yeah. So of course we had to have a Christian version of it. So there was a Christian version of The Legend of Zelda called Spiritual Warfare. <laughs> this was not authorized by Nintendo, shockingly. <laughs> but it was basically a complete ripoff of The Legend of Zelda. Um, there were a few differences. Um, in The Legend of Zelda, you're trying to save a princess. In Spiritual Warfare, you're questing against the powers of darkness. Um, in, uh, in, in The Legend of Zelda, you um, collect weapons on your quest. In Spiritual Warfare, you collect the fruits of the spirit. <laughs> Only they're actual fruits. <laughs> Apples and pomegranates and bananas. <laughs> I'm not kidding, this is real. <laughs> Some of you are like, I don't believe this. I'm going to look this up on Wikipedia later. It's true. And in, in The Legend of Zelda, your enemies are monsters. In Spiritual Warfare, your enemies are the unsaved. Right? <laughs> so when you encounter the unsaved, you throw the fruit of the spirit at them. <laughs> or blow them up with vials of God's wrath. At which point they repent, convert, and disappear. So that was sort of the world I grew up in. And that was the way I approached con conflict and controversy in the world as a Christian. I felt like it was my job to throw my faith at people so that they would convert to what is true. On the subject of homosexuality, I knew that I knew everything there was to know on the topic. I knew that being gay was a choice, I knew that being gay was a sin, and I knew that it was my job to stand up and speak out against it because I wanted to save people from a destructive lifestyle that wasn't God's plan for them. And that probably would have been where this ended and I wouldn't be standing here today were it not for one little thing, which is that God Boy had a secret. It was what I thought was the worst secret in the world. And that was that when I hit puberty and all my guy friends started to notice girls for the first time, you know, really notice them. They used to have cooties and all of a sudden they had boobs. And I... <laughs> I'm always afraid of making that joke on a Christian campus, but it seems to be like the favorite joke of all the Christian campuses <laughs> that I speak at. Um, <laughs> I'm always afraid I'll get a stern talking to later. Um, but it's true, right? So they started to notice girls for the first time and I was having the opposite experience. I was starting to notice guys. And I didn't know why. I mean, at first I thought it was a phase that I would grow out of. I thought this is just, a, it's a thing that's happening. I'm gonna grow out of it. Um, and I tried not to think about it and stay focused on my faith and focused on my schoolwork and focused on my family. And I listened to focus on the family and basically <laughs> tried to continue being a good, you know, God boy. Um, and it wasn't just external things. My faith has always been not just real, but like the most intimate like thing at my core. You know what I'm saying? Like my faith has always been the most important thing in my life. I accepted Christ at a young age. I reconfirmed my life to Christ as a teenager. 
And so I didn't understand how somebody like me, who was a good Christian who loved God, could be attracted to the same sex. But I kept thinking I would grow out of it, and when I didn't grow out of it, I kept praying about it. And when God wasn't changing me, I got to the point that I was crying myself to sleep night after night, begging God, please don't let me feel this way anymore. And finally, I had to admit to my girlfriend, oh yes, I had a girlfriend, that I was attracted to guys and I didn't know why, but I was sure that God was gonna make me straight. And she said she would pray for me and she said, but I mean, I mean, maybe this is how you're gonna be for the rest of your life. And I was like, don't you dare say that. That is not of God. So I broke up with her and <laughs> no, I kid, it didn't really happen that way, but, um, but we did, we did break up. But, I kept thinking that this thing was something that, I, that, that was going to go away, and it didn't. So I finally came to realize that I was gay, not as something I was embracing, but as like the name of a disease that I had. And I discovered that even though I still saw it as a negative thing, and even though I believed that uh, I should never act on these feelings, once I admitted that I was gay, my Christian friends didn't know what to do with me. People started distancing themselves. I stopped getting invitations to events. People started sort of, you know, not being as close as they had been. And, when, and, then, and then I started getting the, uh, the folks coming up to me to say, Justin, have you seen what the scripture has to say on this topic? And I was like, yes, yes. You know, a man should not lie with a man. I'm not lying with anybody. And I suddenly understood for the first time in my life why so many gay people didn't like Christians. There's an episode of South Park where Stan finds out that his dog Sparky is gay. <laughs> and so he trains him and he sits him down and he's like, sit Sparky, good boy. Now shake, good boy. Now don't be gay. <laughs> don't be gay, Spark, don't be gay. And Sparky just kind of looks at him like, Arr? Of course, Cartman's like, hey, still he's pretty gay to me. But, <laughs> that was the reaction of my Christian friends to me. Just don't be gay. Just don't be gay. And I was like, I don't know how to just not be gay, if gay means attracted to the same sex. Now, there's a lot more I could tell you about my journey. I don't uh, have time to get into it, because at some point, I guess Ron has to talk. <laughs> No, you can keep going. I, oh, okay. Ron says I can keep going. No. Ron and I are very, very close friends, as I said, so we kid each other a lot. But the rest of my story, uh, I'm happy to answer questions about it in Q&A. You're uh, welcome to talk to me about it afterwards. Um, I do have a book out, um, which I am sort of legally obligated by my publisher to mention. Uh, no. Uh, but I do have a book called Torn, Rescuing the Gospel from the Gays versus Christians Debate, where I talk a lot about my story. But ultimately, as I went back to scripture, and I started trying to understand the scriptures better because I'd always believed that this was something that people chose and I hadn't chosen it. And I thought maybe there are other things I didn't understand. I ultimately came to a different conclusion through scriptural study from where I had been. Now Ron, as he will share in a minute, has been through some similar things to what I've been through and uh, did not come to the same conclusion I did. But what we want to do this evening is talk to you about how, even though we disagree, we can move this conversation forward on a campus where we want to show first and foremost how we love one another as Christians. So uh, Justin has all this fancy technology. Um, I worked at Microsoft too long to use technology in a presentation. So uh, I prefer notes that do not have the blue screen feature. <laughs> um, so interestingly enough, uh, Justin and I both grew up uh, Southern Baptist. Um, and so there's a lot of similarities to it. I was, grew up in the Pacific Northwest where even Southern Baptists are not as crazy as uh, they are in where Justin grew up. We did not have these crazy games. Um, and uh, so in some ways, my growing up experience, uh, there was a kind of schizophrenia to it. Of, I was in a Southern Baptist church that 
It was a very loving Southern Baptist church. Um, it's, uh, it was in the North, which meant it was far removed from the kind of hard turn to the culture wars that uh, was going on in the Southern Baptist Convention at the time that both Justin and I were growing up. So a lot of the time, um, what I heard at that church was a much more classic Southern Baptist approach of not being involved in politics, that you know, there could, Christians could have different opinions about politics, but that the focus of the church was on sharing the gospel, it was on grace. Um, and you know, so you, at the church there were recovering drug addicts, um, and you could see you know, the retired bank vice president in his perfect three-piece suit and cufflinks shaking hands with and greeting the recovering drug addict in a torn t-shirt and uh, jeans. So it was this, you know, in many ways, this very loving, very accepting um, church environment. However, um, occasionally we got revival preachers from Texas or places like that who came up. Um, and there you got a somewhat different <laughs> version. Um, so, for example, I remember one revival preacher who was saying uh, that unless America um, brought back the death penalty for um, they would destroy America the way that he had destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. And since this was a Southern Baptist revival, he then said, can I get an amen? And of course, everyone gave him one. It you know, would be polite or impolite to refuse. Uh, <laughs> he's asked. We're a polite group. Um, but so there, you know, I had this experience of listening as all of the people around me respond to the idea that we should kill gay people with enthusiasm. You know, not the way that we might discuss other issues of, you know, well, maybe that would be too extreme of an approach, but just a sort of unthinking acceptance. And, you know, I was not as bad as Justin, I'm going to say, on being God boy. <laughs> <laughs> but I did know my Bible pretty well. And so I knew that there were other things that we were not punishing the way that the Old Testament said that they should be punished. And so if, if God was mad at America for not punishing homosexuality the way it was supposed to be punished in Leviticus, there were other things, but nobody was calling for that. Um, <clears throat> so it, I'm a teacher now. And one of the things that's a tough challenge as a teacher is the question, am I going to be one of those strict graders who you know, really forces my students to, you know, my students will be scared of me, but if they survive my class, they'll really have been forced to excel, or am I gonna be a kinder grader? Uh, if you look at me on Rate My Professors, I think the consensus on my students is that I'm on the kinder end. <laughs> but, you know, you have, there's leeway as to how you do that approach. But if you have a professor that takes one group of students and treats them very harshly, and a different group of students and grades them very leniently, then you're not looking at a professor who's made a choice about how to balance sort of being encouraging to students versus being strict. You have one who has picked a group to be kind to and a group to be harsh to. And so that was what I saw growing up. Not that, you know, I did not see this as a question of, um, is the church being faithful to what the Bible says, or um, is the church being unfaithful? I looked at it and saw very clearly a different standard. That uh, when we talked about uh, divorce and remarriage, or when we talked about um, how to treat uh, couples who were having sex before marriage, or those kinds of things, um, you had the kind of approach 
that gets you a really nice rating on RateMyProfessors.com. <laughs> you know, go to this pastor. He'll give you an easy A. Um, on the other hand, when we talked about homosexuality, there was very harsh condemnation. Uh, very, very strict application of very literal readings of the New Testament with very little thought to grace or to how we might uh, think about the person or those sorts of things. Um, so um, I was a lot more rebellious than Justin and saw pretty clearly pretty early on that the way the church was addressing this issue was just unfair. And so I started pretty early on thinking, you know, what I think we should do is grade on the same curve, grade homosexuality on the same curve that everyone else is graded on. <laughs> um, and so for example, things, you know, I knew that if you looked at the New Testament on divorce, there, there were very strict things. But in our church, um, there was leeway, not a sort of wholesale embrace of divorce and remarriage, but an understanding of the difficulties of people's situation, the desire to extend grace, etc. And I thought there should be a similar kind of openness or um, you know, something like that on gay issues. So <clears throat> I started, uh, for example, in my senior year in high school, um, I gave a speech on, in favor of gays in the military, uh, which got me uh, to semifinals in state. Um, I was a little bit, I was very competitive. <laughs> Justin was God boy, I was competitive boy. <laughs> <laughs> um, I was very disappointed only to make it that far, but that was something where um, I was out arguing for gay rights. And then I started looking at how am I going to justify this theologically, and the more that I started to think about it, the more that I started to think, hey, maybe we need to be more consistent here. Um, not that we shouldn't be gracious and try to respond with kindness and understanding to people in difficult situations, but that there, it may be that we've actually not been challenging straight people enough. That there's too much accommodation with the Bible and that maybe we need to have, we need to take seriously the challenge that I was seeing in the New Testament. I could say a lot more about that. What I'll just say briefly is, um, when I was in college, so initially that was just a very frustrating realization. Here's this prohibition, but then what does that mean for me? When I was in college, I came across a little book called On Spiritual Friendship by a medieval monk named Elred of Riveau. And in that book, he talked about um, the importance of friendship in a way that I think in an American context where we focus so much on marriage and romance and tend to ignore other ways of expressing love, it was a sort of revelation to me to see that there were possibilities of having really deep and meaningful connection with another person that was not based on sex. And with three seconds to remain of my <laughs> time, I will now transition over uh, and talk a little bit about practical tips. I even did it the right way. <laughs> um, so Justin talked about how we've been friends for a very long time. And in these presentations that we do, we try to talk about how to have productive conversations. So one thing that I think it would be worth saying is that part of how we learned how to have productive conversations was to have a lot of unproductive conversations. <laughs> Um, so Justin and I met, and we were both, we had very similar backgrounds, we were both very, very interested in theology, and we disagreed. So we spent a lot of time, I mean, I think we were new to this and naive, and both of us thought, well, it's just a matter of explaining the 
write arguments, and then Justin will see that he's wrong, or Ron will see that he's wrong. And, you know, several of our emails were written with the expectation that at the end of the email, that was going to be the end of the conversation. <laughs> and I say this because I suspect, you know, we talked about in the introduction, encouraging you guys to take a risk on having these conversations. And I think it's important to say that it is a risk. And most likely, your first few tries at it will be frustrating. But I think part of what has made this work for Justin and I was that we were willing to apologize and we were willing to keep trying to pick up the pieces and go on. Um, and I think honestly Justin was a lot more forgiving and helped to deal with my argumentativeness um, in a way that I think made a big difference in keeping the conversation going. Okay, so first of all, no. <laughs> Don't make homosexuality a litmus test. Um, so think about things like um, the Episcopal Church, which for a long time had John Shelby Spong, who was a bishop who did not believe in the divinity of Christ, for example, or the, the existence of God or the virgin birth or just really central Christian teachings. And a lot of people in the Episcopal Church were upset at his presence, but the church did not split. And in 2003, Eugene Robinson was elected a bishop in the church, and then the church split. Eugene Robinson was, as far as I can tell, a fairly moderate evangelical in terms of his beliefs. Nothing that I would write home as a great bishop who represents what I want to see in a bishop, but much better than, Eugene, than uh, John Shelby Spawn. But the church split. And one of the things that re we really want to encourage is don't make that kind of, this is the most important thing there is. What we want is this is an important conversation, we need to have it, but we also need to recognize the centrality of the gospel itself. Okay, so this is where the conversation gets it's fun because now we have uh, only a few minutes, uh, like a couple minutes for each of our points. So, the second tip for uh, productive dialogue is you've got to define your terms. Now, this may seem really obvious when you're talking about a term like LGBT, you know, where it's sort of like, oh, not everyone might know what LGBT means. So you have to say, well, that's when you take a BLT and put guacamole on it, that's LGBT. <laughs> That joke did not deserve the laughs it got, let me just say. <laughs> um, lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender, right? So that term might seem obvious, but there are other terms that may not seem obvious that you need to define that you do have to define. I can tell you I have seen more arguments and misunderstandings on, these, uh, on this topic from not defining terms than from just about anything else. For instance, the word gay. I mean, we all think we know what the word gay means, but um, my organization, the Gay Christian Network, did a study recently where we found that if you ask LGBT people, LGBT people almost universally define the word gay as someone who is attracted to the same sex, regardless of whether they ever act on their attractions, even if they might be married to a member of the opposite sex, if they're attracted to the same sex and not the opposite sex, they're gay. And if they're attracted to the opposite sex, they're straight. And if they're attracted to both sexes, they're bisexual, right? A good chunk of the straight conservative Christians we surveyed said that, uh, in fact, well, over half of the straight conservative Christians we surveyed um, defined the term gay differently. Um, a good chunk of them said that if someone is married to a member of the opposite sex, then they are, by, uh, they are automatically straight. So we're defining the words differently. So then if you have a question, uh, a question like, uh, is it a choice to be gay? Well, if you don't define the word gay the same way, of course you're going to end up arguing. The same thing is true for a term like homosexuality. People say, is homosexuality a sin? And I say, well, how do you define homosexuality? What do you mean by homosexuality? To put it another way, if you believe that sex before marriage is sinful, and I ask you, is heterosexuality before marriage a sin? How do you interpret that question? 
Because the 12 year old girl who notices a cute guy in her class, that's heterosexuality before marriage. <laughs> if you're straight and you go on a date with someone of the opposite sex to the movies and you hold hands, that is heterosexuality before marriage. If you are not dating anyone and you are attracted to someone of the opposite sex, that's heterosexual. So, so my point is when people say, well, I think homosexuality is a sin, usually what they mean is I believe that same sex sexual behavior is sinful. And I know that's a mouthful. But the problem is when we just talk about homosexuality, you may be thinking about a sex act and someone you're talking to may be thinking about themselves and their own existence. And so it's really important to define your terms. Um, one more term I'll mention is the term homosexual. And I mention this only because a lot of gay people actually really don't like the term homosexual. This is not universal, but a lot of gay people would prefer not to be called homosexual. For a lot of reasons, I won't get into it, but a lot of it is that it, it puts a lot of emphasis on the sexual part, as if gay people are more sexual than straight people. Um, but also because it's, it's for a long time been linked to um, uh, anti-gay groups that gay people don't like, obviously. Um, and some of these groups even, like there's one group that intentionally, they took uh, stories from the Associated Press and reposted them on their website with a computer program, changing the word gay to homosexual every single place that it appeared, just because they knew that that was the term that gay people don't prefer, which made them look a little silly when Sprinter Tyson Gay was in the news, he won a... <laughs> Homosexual eases into 100 final at Olympic trials. <laughs> On Saturday, homosexual misjudged the finish in his opening heat. <laughs> so define your terms and be careful about terms that other people don't prefer. Oh. Uh, so we want to distinguish between orientation and behavior. Um, so Justin kind of touched on this in the difference between using homosexual to mean uh, specific sexual acts versus using it to describe orientation. So a couple of things I want to say. First, uh, part of this goes to the sort of much more basic Christian theological distinction between temptation and sin. So even if we agree that uh, gay sex is a sin, which Justin and I do not. But even if we took that um, traditional of a position, um, the desire for sexual acts would be a temptation, not a sin. And so it make, you don't want to be condemning people just for experiencing a particular pattern of temptation. Um, but also, I think it's important to say that um, sexual orientation is a lot more than just desire for particular sexual acts. That the way that um, people relate to people of the same sex or people of the opposite sex um, is colored by sexual orientation in ways that have far beyond specific attraction to desire sexual intimacy with that person. And if we forget that, I think we end up trivializing what we're talking about to just desire for sexual acts and forgetting a great deal of relational complexity. So this is one of Stephen Covey's Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, right? Seek first to understand, then to be understood. And I, I think it's really important to understand what we mean by seek first to understand. Um, this is the way of Jesus. Jesus showed an interest in people's humanity. He didn't just walk around preaching at people. People came to hear what he had to say because he met their needs and showed interest in them and care for them as human beings. And often we forget to do that. Now when people talk about this and say, seek first to understand, or you should try to understand the other person's point of view, sometimes they phrase it in a way that I think is really bad. They'll say, you know, do this sort of like, well, hey man, can we all get along? Like everyone's opinion is valid, man. That's stupid. Um, <laughs> I mean, that's like, that reminds me of uh, the scene from Fiddler on the Roof where Tevye is like listening to these Jewish scholars argue and one of them makes one point and Tevye is like, oh, he's right. And then the other one makes the opposing point and Tevye is like, oh, he's right. 
And there's this other guy watching, he's like, wait a minute, wait a minute, he is right and he is right? They can't both be right. And Tevye thinks for a minute and goes, you know you are also right. <laughs> <laughs> That is silly. That makes no sense. Ron and I can't both be right if we disagree on such an important theological question. And the reality is, if you have an opinion on this issue, you don't think that the other people who disagree with you in this room are right. You think that they're wrong. Anytime you've got an opinion on, on an issue, uh, you think that other people are wrong. Everyone's opinion is not equally valid. Unless the question is like, what's your favorite flavor of ice cream or something, then everyone's opinion is equally valid. Unless you choose butter pecan, in which case you're wrong and you're going to hell. But <laughs> we don't think that each other is, is right, but we can show respect to one another. I can try to understand where Ron is coming from, even if I think that his beliefs are completely wrong and harmful. And he can do the same for me. And in fact, that is a much more effective way. If he wants to change my mind because he thinks that I believe something that's sinful, he's going to be much more effective at getting me to consider his view by being my friend and showing an interest in me as a person and in what I believe and trying to understand me than if he just tries to debate with me. Because when you're debating with someone, the whole time you're making your really brilliant point, all they're thinking about is how they're gonna come back with you, like, like what their rebuttal is gonna be, right? But if you show an interest in someone as a friend, you have a much greater chance of actually uh, being close enough to them for them to care what you think about anything. And that's part of why Ron's and my friendship works. Um, oh, okay. Um, I was looking at the next slide, not my slide. <laughs> um, so one of the things that uh, is a big subject of debate is the question of what causes homosexuality. And we could talk about that at great length, but I think it's in many ways, at this point, we really do not know the answer to that question. Um, and in a lot of ways, the answer to the question is irrelevant to the question of, uh, you know, the scientific cause is very different from the question of morality. Uh, there are lots of psychological conditions that lead people to, you know, be overly angry or whatever, but it doesn't mean if I have anger management problems, it's okay for me to punch Justin. <laughs> I don't, don't worry. <laughs> um, but one thing that is really important to stress in all of the uncertainty about the science is that people do not choose to be gay. Another thing to say is that there's a lot of open-endedness in and complexity to sexuality. So you'll hear stories of people who've been married to the opposite sex for a long time and then come out in midlife and start a relationship with someone of the same sex. We'll hear the other kind of story, someone who's been um, living in a gay relationship or gay relationships for an extended period of time, who then decides to uh, enter into a marriage. And there's a lot of, you know, sometimes that's bisexuality, sometimes that's sexual fluidity, but while there's a lot of complexity to that, it doesn't mean that in any individual case that person has a choice about who they are attracted to or who they fall in love with. And beyond that, it's important to stress that although there are these cases of complexity, um, there are also a very large number of people for whom sexual orientation is much more fixed and who don't experience any kind of fluidity or bisexual desire. So it's really important not to make assumptions that we know the cause or make assumptions that we can, uh, that someone can change if they're asked to. All right, share stories. This is one of these things, uh, it sounds really kind of hippie liberal, so forgive me for just a moment. But actually, Ron and I both agree that sharing your story is a really, really important way of moving the conversation forward. And it goes back to what I was saying a minute ago about how debate doesn't help. Um, when we just 
argue scripture with each other, we're not likely to change each other's minds. Even though Ron and I both would say that scripture is critical in understanding your theology. But let me give you an example. How many of you have seen E.T.? All right, the rest of you are deprived, along with the butter pecan folks. Um, okay, so E.T., great, sweet story about this lovable alien from outer space. Um, when you see this film, you want aliens to come visit from outer space, right? Here's the thing. Suppose your, uh, your friend, your neighbor, has never, you know, suppose aliens actually are coming. This is on the news. Aliens are coming from outer space. You're excited and your friend is freaking out and he's like, bring out the big guns. Let's blow these critters out of the sky. And you're like, why? Well, your friend's never seen E.T. He's seen War of the Worlds. <laughs> Our stories, what we've been through, what we've experienced, say something about how we emotionally resonate with things. And this matters to us as Christians. This is part of why the Bible is told as a collection of stories. Jesus taught in parables. Stories resonate with us on a level that's, that allows us to move past just theological debate to actually understand one another. And so, um, and I'm out of time. This is the first time that I've ever run out of time before Ron. I'm so mad. <laughs> um, so let me sum this up. I have one more point, but hopefully Ron will let me make it. But, <laughs> Um, so, but stories allow us to get past just that theological debate and to actually um, understand where one another is coming from so that I can say to you, here's what I've been through. And you can say to me, here's why I believe what I believe and what I've been through to get there. And we have a way to connect with one another before we get to all the theological stuff so that you can show your neighbor E.T. Um, so, uh, in terms of talking about friendship, last week I was at uh, a discussion panel on same-sex marriage at Notre Dame. Um, same-sex marriage is even more controversial than just talking about uh, homosexuality or how we should respond to uh, LGBT people in the church. Um, and one of the things that was discussed a lot in the panel is the way that political discussions tend to be just flinging slogans back and forth. That uh, there's caricatures of each side and there's very little uh, serious engagement. And so in the question and answer period, um, I had complained about this problem more than other members of the panel. So someone in the audience said, well, how do you fix that? Um, and what I said was, I think a big part of being able to have intelligent conversation is being friends with people who disagree with you. Um, so for example, I'm friends with John Corvino, who is, uh, has written a couple of books on same-sex marriage, is a reasonably prominent advocate of same-sex marriage. Um, and you know, I'm acknowledged in his most recent book, which means that we spent a very long time arguing about the book before it came out. <laughs> um, but that conversation was very helpful, both for me to understand where he was coming from and for him to understand more clearly where someone who disagrees with him is coming from and to understand the reasons behind objections to his arguments. And I think another thing that's really important from that kind of conversation is that um, when you get to know someone as a friend and trust them, you can admit a lot of the shortcomings of your own side in ways that you would not in a two-minute interview on CNN. And that sort of ability to be a bit more honest about the ways that the conversation is failing because of the things that people on each side of the conversation are doing wrong is really helpful for the possibility of moving forward in a better way. Now, I don't know that people will listen enough for it to make a difference, but that's really important, I think, for having productive conversations. You can have your time. Thank you, my, my overtime time, my overtime point. One final point, uh, and one, way that, that one final way that Ron and I uh, agree. 
is that the church's focus needs to be not just homosexuality, pro or con. Are you for or against it? As if you go into a voting booth and, you know, vote. Homosexuality, let's see, I'm going to vote no. <laughs> it's important to remember that I am gay. Ron is gay. Um, we, we have very different ideas about how we should live as a result of that. But the question that faces us as Christians, and the qu question that faces all LGBT people as Christians, is not, should I be LGBT or not? Because most of us would have chosen not, had that been an option. The question is, now what? Now how do we live? And so, if you believe, um, as I do, that the church should embrace committed relationships for same-sex couples, then the now what needs to be, how do we as a church teach people, say, sexual ethics in those relationships? What does that look like? How do we support them? How do we do more than just take a position and go to the voting booth and vote in favor of same-sex marriage? What does it really look like to be the church to those folks? And if you believe, as Ron does, that those relationships are sinful, that that's not what God wants for a gay person, then how do we as a church support um, gay folks in celibacy, where are, the, where are the support groups for celibate folks who are facing a lifetime of being on their own as all of their friends get married and start families? What happens when someone who's single, gay, straight, bi, whatever, gets older and doesn't have a family to take care of them and they get sick and they need that? These are questions the church needs to be asking, not just let me vote against same-sex marriage. So the question is always, always, always people-focused. How do we love our neighbor? Now what? Um, so a couple of remarks just in conclusion. Um, and so we're focusing tonight on talking about how Justin and I have been able to have productive conversations about um, how the church should respond to gay, lesbian, bisexual issues. I think it's important to say, though, that a big part of the reason that Justin and I are able to have those productive conversations, in addition to having had a lot of unproductive conversations, <laughs> is that we're friends, which means that there are a lot of other things that we have in common. Uh, we're both kind of computer nerds. Um, we both really like Agatha Christie. Um, I listened to Justin tell me about pop culture stuff. Uh, <laughs> there's only one person who thought that joke was funny. <laughs> it's so true. <laughs> so, a big, I mean, I think a really important thing to remember, are you okay, Justin? <laughs> <laughs> a really important thing to remember is that in order to be able to have productive conversations about difficult topics, it's important to have things that you can fall back on when, if the conversation has gotten too difficult, then perhaps today would be a good day for talking about Hercule Poirot. Um, we both like Agatha Christie mysteries, so that's going to be a safe topic. Um, and just having these other things that we enjoy talking about and doing together is really helpful for building the trust and context for having difficult conversations. So as you're thinking about how do we have these conversations, I mean, think about the depth of the conversation about homosexuality should fit with the depth of the friendship as a whole. You know, if you're thinking about wanting to have a difficult conversation about this, don't walk up to a stranger. <laughs> You know, have these conversations with closer friends, or if you're starting to get to know someone who you disagree with on this topic, look for other things to talk about as well. Look for other things to do together. Uh, at this point, I think we're closing down and opening up for discussion. So uh, hang on for just a second while we reconfigure and we'll start the discussion. Give my hand. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right, folks, you've seen the, uh, I think it's going to be up there, the... Uh, where you can text? Did you see where you can text? Have we gotten questions coming in? A lot of Sorry. questions? Not so many, okay. That's good. If we don't get to all the questions tonight, we may roll some of them over into to tomorrow night.
right? So if you're frustrated, like, why aren't you dealing with my question? Maybe tomorrow. Maybe tomorrow. <clears throat> I'm so mad you beat me wrong. <laughs> so mad. <laughs> beat you on laughter? No. <laughs> on time. You laughed more than uh, ever. All right, so here we are in our, uh, this is in our, you know, our residence hall here. Can you see us in our residence hall? You can kind of listen in. All right. So, a couple questions for me. Um, so, we are not debating, is this true? We are not debating whether there are gay people. Is that fair? Yes. I, I'm not yeah. sure. Yeah, okay. Just, just check it. I want to make sure I got all this. We are not debating whether there are gay Christians. Um, but we are discussing whether gay Christians can perhaps be in monogamous relationships versus whether they should practice celibacy. We're talking about kind of what you do with this. That's the now what part, right? Um, one of you is Protestant. The other is Catholic. Um, Protestants don't have a strong celibacy tradition. We don't have priests who sort of exercise that on a reg regular basis. To some degree, do you think your disagreement on this could be a Protestant versus Catholic informed response? Go. <laughs> well, I mean, I would say that I don't, th I, I'm, I'm the Protestant one in case that's not obvious. Um, I don't, I, don't, I don't think that's as, as much a part of it because, you know, I certainly respect um, the, um, the value of celibacy for, for those who, who choose celibacy. I mean, the Christian tradition has a long tradition. I mean, Southern Baptists don't really seem to know much about tradition, but um, the Christian, I mean, the, we have a long history of, uh, of celibacy in Christianity. But my view is that some folks have a gift of celibacy, and I don't think that that, 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 that means that people should be um, required to be celibate, um, who do not feel that, 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 that that's their calling. But my view on that is not ultimately because it's how I think it should be, it is how I understand the scriptures. And then, of course, that gets into stuff we'll talk about tomorrow. Fair enough, Ron. Yeah. So a couple of things. Um, first of all, um, the I, there's a blog that I uh, have helped to edit. It was up there a minute ago. Spiritual friendship, and about half of the contributors there are Protestant. So it's certainly a significant number of um, gay Christians who hold a traditional understanding who are Protestant. Um, think that celibacy can be a viable approach. Uh, the other thing that I would say is that I grew up Protestant, and for me this was more something that I got out of my study of the New Testament than something that I got after I became Catholic. So I saw um, in the New Testament a strong discussion of celibacy. Mm -hmm. And um, also I think the first sort of contemporary place that I saw a strong witness to celibacy was in Elizabeth Elliot's um, Passion and Purity, where she was talking about how she felt called to be a missionary and believed that that call could mean being celibate. And so that was the first place that I saw a sort of credible contemporary Christian witness to the idea that um, obedience to God could mean celibacy. So I, I think that there's um, certainly more attention in the Catholic tradition, but in some ways in the Catholic tradition it gets to be entirely a discussion about priests and monks rather than something that can be part of lay life. So I, I think the conversation um, has some, there's certainly ways that it's different in the Protestant and Catholic world, but that there's resources for it in both. Mm -hmm. Um, so we've got questions coming in here. Uh, do both of you feel that you could keep an open mind that your opinions could change? Have your opinions changed, right? You know, the president's been talking about how his thinking has evolved, right? Have you evolved? Is there evolving here? Is it static? Is there well, movement? 
my view has certainly changed, obviously, because I used to be on Ron's side of things, and, and now I'm on my side of things. <laughs> um, uh, when you, you know, and, and when you ask, can, could you have an open mind? I feel this is something I've spent a lot of time studying and praying about and, and thinking about. And I'm, anyone in this room who uh, has spent a lot of time on any element of, of your faith, um, you know, would you remain open, for instance, to the, the idea that you could be wrong about the Trinity or about, you know, Jesus being the Son of God or something like that? If it's something that, you know, is really uh, critical, well, hopefully, yes, to the extent that if God revealed to you that you were wrong, that you would be willing to listen and that you're always willing to, to ask questions and, and so forth. But at the same time, sometimes there are elements that we, you know, you, you come to a conclusion and you say, well, you know, until I see evidence to the contrary, I'm going to have to make a decision. I'm going to have to move forward. Um, you, you can't just kind of go through life keeping your mind perpetually open and, re and second guessing yourself on everything you believe all the time. But hopefully your mind is open enough that you're willing to listen to new information. And so that's where I feel like I am on this. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I think a couple of things. First of all, um, I teach philosophy. So that means presenting uh, every view on whatever question. So I'm very much just professionally trained to look at uh, different sides of the issue. And I think that willingness to look at a wide range of evidence um, is really helpful for moving forward, whether that means changing my mind. And you know, the interesting thing about Justin and I is that both of us kind of started out on the opposite side from the one that we take now. Um, but being willing to listen carefully to opposing views um, helps me to either, there's a kind of openness to change if I see convincing evidence, but there's also a deepening of my own understanding of my position. If I just refuse to look at anything that could challenge me, my own beliefs become kind of brittle and what I've seen over time is that people who take that approach, often it holds up to a certain point and then it all falls apart in some kind of crisis. And I think the ultimately openness, I think, makes my beliefs much more resilient because having been open to let them be tested, being open to changing them if I saw convincing evidence um, also means that as I consider those things and then come back to, well, no, I actually do really believe this. Mm. It's a much deeper conviction than if it was just, no, 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 I don't want to hear um, anything that challenges me. You know, at a certain point, stuff will get through those defenses and then everything will fall apart. Dude, that's a really good answer. Can I change my answer? Yes. <laughs> next time you speak. <laughs> I'll um, go first next time. Too. There's, there's a lot of uh, questions that are coming in that sort of say, hey, it's a tough political culture. You, you're sort of afraid to even raise these issues because you don't want to say the wrong thing, right? There's, there's sort of microaggressions that have arisen, like to just say, like, uh, you don't seem very gay, right? Like, that's not really something you don't want to say because you're suddenly... Or, or um, I have a cousin like you, we might say, as a way to try to try to bridge the gap, and yet we're starting to you know, get to these tough things. Is there a way for a campus like Pepperdine to be more uh, conducive to those who are feeling persecuted or afraid to, to come out as gay? What kind of atmosphere can we create? You said you wanted to go first? Oh, I meant next time we do this presentation. <laughs> oh, I so I don't, so you can't steal my answer. <laughs> Um, well, so I think the thing that I would say above all is that it needs to be a conversation where we can be talking with people rather than talking about them. So um, there needs to be safety for people to talk about their experiences and openness on the part of the campus to listen. And my impression, I mean, I'm an outsider, so I can't 
speak to that too well, but my impression from speaking with both students and uh, staff and faculty at Pepperdine is that um, there's a sincere effort to do that. There may be a long way to go, but one of the ways that you figure out what you need to do next is you start that conversation and then listen to where students are saying, here's what is making this conversation difficult for us. And then we think about how to address that. But the starting point is making it possible to have a conversation with the people who are concerned rather than just a conversation about. And I think the fact that Justin and I are here to talk um, is part of that, that it's, this is a conversation with the LGBT community rather than just a conversation about them. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and I think it's critical, I think that's excellent too. Um, and, and I think I think it's critical that this be uh, people focused, um, and also that there be space for people to express their their questions and their disagreements without fearing that they are going to uh, be labeled for them. So, for instance. Someone who comes to Ron's conclusion needs to be able to say, uh, I believe that, that this is the way it is, I believe this is what God intends, without being labeled a bigot or a homophobe. That's not fair. Um, if that's how you understand the Bible, that's how you understand the Bible. By the same token, I would ask that someone who comes to the conclusion that I do not be treated as if they're not really a Christian or they haven't really spent time studying the scriptures. Mm -hmm. You can believe that I am mistaken, but, 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 uh, but believe that I am sincerely mistaken. Because it's one thing to say, I think that you have read this wrong. I love you, brother, but I think that you're wrong on this. I think you've misunderstood God's will. Which is really what Ron says to me. Not in those exact words, but that's the message, right? But that's very different from saying, if you've come to that conclusion, clearly you're rebelling against God, you haven't really paid attention to what the Bible has to say, and you're not really a Christian. Um, because what th the first message is basically, it's saying, I acknowledge that you want to serve God, and I think you've gone down the wrong trail, but I acknowledge you're trying, you're trying to do the right thing. And haven't we all made mistakes, you know? So I think it's important that people be able to come to a conclusion that's different from yours without being labeled or, or demonized for it. But you can still say, I disagree, and I think we want to continue this conversation. But we disagree on a lot of things theologically. And this is the one that, you know, as Ron said earlier, becomes the litmus test. Mm. Can I just say one other thing on that? Um, one of the things that I've found from having conversations with Justin about this is that it has really deepened my understanding of the Christian faith to think about, okay, so I think gay sex is wrong, but if the greatest commandments are love God and love neighbor, then what are we saying about love? And you know, in a culture where love is very much equated with sexual intimacy, like then how do we think about love in a way that makes it a part of everyone's life? Um, rather than just saying, thou shalt not love to gay and lesbian people. And so I think um, the sort of very polarized, just placing someone in a category and condemning them because they disagree with you on this litmus test issue, um, ultimately is destructive for understanding our faith. And this more thoughtful, trying to engage with the arguments that are made, uh, can be an opportunity for really deepening, you know, and I still take a very traditional interpretation of the Bible, but in engaging with Justin, I've had to fit that interpretation with a lot of other themes in scripture, rather than just saying, well, gay sex is wrong. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We challenge each other a lot. Mm -hmm. Um, w one thing I like about the sort of the anonymous nature of being able to submit questions is that some of the, these are there's some personal questions here that are clearly rooted in in personal struggles and so I want to sort of bring some of those things up um, for example um, you know have you ever found yourself feeling that God was betraying you you know in in who you were made and how you were um, did you ever question your faith in the sense of why God, why? And even what would you say perhaps to a secretly gay Christian who is also 
absolutely positive that homosexuality is a sin that needs to be avoided or righted. So um, I'll speak to the first part of that. I, um, I never felt betrayed by God um, in this process. I did feel betrayed by the church. And, um, and I will tell you, I have seen many people walk away from their faith because of their treatment by fellow Christians, which breaks my heart. Um, it's, it's amazing. You can think that you're the strongest Christian in the world. You could be God boy. Um, well, I mean, if you're female, you probably aren't God boy, but <laughs> be God woman or God girl, or what, depending on your age, I guess. But anyway, the point is, you can be the strongest Christian on earth, uh, or think you are. And when all of your Christian support network falls away, and people turn on you and are more interested in preaching at you than in coming alongside you and saying, how can I support you right now? How can I love you? You know, or just, or just spending time not talking about this or, or whatever. It's amazing how weak you suddenly become. And, and, and you realize how important Christian community is. Mm -hmm. And when you don't have that sense of community, it is very hard to stay a Christian. Um, it's very hard. Um, so, you know, I think, I think that's, uh, that's really important. I, I maybe should let Ron speak more to the, to the latter part of that question, though. Okay, well, I think I'll say a little bit the, more the first part. Sorry. about uh, the first part. So actually, I was talking just this afternoon with a friend of mine. You know, one of the things about going out and speaking publicly, writing about these issues, is that there are a bunch of people on the internet who um, then think that they're free to unload. Uh, and it's a, the kind of conversation that occurs um, on the internet, whether it's in comment boxes or even you know, stuff that's written in online publications by people who have never met you, can be just incredibly cruel. Uh, I see you know, huge misrepresentations of my position. And so I was just this afternoon having a conversation with a friend about how um, it just really saps, you know, to be making difficult sacrifices to try to follow my understanding of um, what the Bible says, of what the church has taught traditionally. And then to have people who aren't trying to give positive answers themselves, who are just trying to rip apart our efforts to provide positive answers is very dispiriting. Um, and you know, at times, I think that does call into question, you know, okay, God, you've you know, given these commandments. You know, why is it? that I'm striving to follow you and getting all of this negative stuff. Now, you know, I can go look at the scripture and see there's lots of other examples. You know, I'm not the only person who asks these hard questions. Um, so it's not a surprise in Christian faith to find that we have challenges and that there are hard questions uh, and that there can be real suffering. But I think it is um, any time we face real challenges, whether it's from the way that the church is responding or um, loneliness, isolation, all of these things make it easy to look up and say, God, where are you? God, why are you letting me go through this? Um, and as I say, if you read the Bible, if you look at Christian history, these are questions that can be found all over both the Old and New Testaments. They're questions 
that are repeated again and again in every generation. So this isn't ultimately something that should cause us to lose faith, but it is a real question that when we deal with suffering, when we deal with struggle, uh, that does challenge our faith, it can also be an opportunity to deepen our faith. But that deepening only happens when we really are willing to admit and grapple with the challenge. So, can I then... Do you like that answer too? Yeah, well, but I, but I want to make sure we don't miss that's the, the last part of that question, though. Because I, I, particularly for someone who is, you know, as, how do they put it, secretly a gay Christian. And yet opposed. And yet opposed, yeah, yeah. So, let me say this. There are many, many Christians who believe it would be wrong um, for them to have a, a same-sex sexual relationship or even a same-sex romantic relationship, but who are gay. If by gay you mean attracted to the same sex. They didn't choose to be. They might do just about anything not to be, and yet here they are. Um, they need the love and support of, of their community. They need to have a support network, and often they're terrified to, to come out to anybody because they're afraid that, the, that their life is forever going to be marked by this secret. And it's a terrible kind of secret to hold inside. It can tear you apart. It can make you depressed. It can, it can cause you to feel so isolated. Um, I think it's important to have people you can confide in, to have people that you can talk to in your life um, who will will support you in following the path that you believe God's called you to, to follow. And I will say that um, if by, you know, I think that homosexuality is a sin, you mean uh, I think that it would be wrong for me to act on these feelings, there are a number of resources for gay Christians who commit themselves to lifelong celibacy, as Ron has. Um, Ron's spiritual friendship blog is a, is a great place to go. Um, um, there's a, a, a Wesley Hills book, Washed, yeah, washed and, and Waiting, washed and waiting um, by Wesley Hill is a book by a gay Christian in this situation that's a very good. Um, my organization, the Gay Christian Network, has folks on, both on my side and on Ron's side, theologically, um, probably more folks, well, not probably, definitely more folks on my <laughs> side than on Ron's side, but there is a, what we call a side B support uh, group within that community. So it's a, a, you know, an anonymous uh, you know, online community where people can get that kind of support. If you mean that you want to change your attractions so that you become entirely heterosexually oriented, I will tell you that that does not seem to happen, typically. Um, I've heard a few stories of people who say that that's what happened to them, and I, I don't know, you know, I can't look into their heads. But it does not seem to be the experience of the, the vast majority of people, um, which is why Exodus International shut down earlier. So I would suggest to you, if that's what you're looking for, that you do not have to be free of temptation in your life in order to live according to your convictions. And I will always support someone in living according to their convictions, even if that means that they don't feel free to do something that I think they should be. Maybe slightly tougher questions. Uh, you know, for Justin, how do you justify um, same-sex uh, activity as not being sexually immoral? Right? And, uh, you know, for In Ron... 300 words or less. For Ron, right? you know, for Ron, if you are gay and yet you're not acting on that, are you somehow punishing yourself? Are you sort of, in a sense, cutting off who God's made you to be? Um, folks aren't, aren't sure they sort of understand how you got to where you, got, where you are on this. How do you live you with first. these? Okay. <laughs> Well, so here's the, here's the short version of my answer to that question. Um, and obviously, that's not the, the primary thing we want to talk about tonight, because we want to talk about how we agree tonight and then talk more about the disagreement tomorrow. So feel free to ask me the really hard uh, questions along those lines uh, tomorrow. But um, in general, I will say, I ultimately came to the conclusion that when the Bible talks about um, homosexual behavior, which it only does in a few places, that the things it's talking about are not committed relationships. You know, we, we look at when the Bible says negative things about text collectors, we understand it's talking about the, the uh, harmful, de deceptive, sinful practices of tax collectors in Jesus' day. We don't use that then to turn around and condemn IRS agents. Uh, when the, when, mm -hmm. Some of I us. I mean, you know, we might like to, but. <laughs> Um, you know, when, when the Bible, um, you know, when Paul says in the New Testament, uh, women must wear head coverings when they pray. 
Well, probably most of the women in this room pray without their heads covered because they understand that to be cultural rather than you know, a, a commandment for today. And so um, the same kinds of uh, uh, arguments that we would make about passages like that um, I think apply to the few passages that mention homosexual behavior. For instance, when you look at the Sodom story, this is not, as I'd initially thought, you know, a story about there's this gay city and then God destroys it because they're gay. If you actually read the story, there's a city where all of the men of the city participate in an attempted gang rape against two angels. And it doesn't make sense to think that all of the men of the city were gay, uh, it seems much more likely that th this is sex being used as a weapon, as has, has happened in many uh, cases throughout history, where gang rape uh, of men against men uh, is a way to, to, to basically show somebody who's boss to say, you know, uh, you know, well, you know what I'm saying, right? So <laughs> I'm trying to not get, I really want to get into this whole historical thing, and I'm like, okay. Um, so that's an example of, I don't see, regardless of the purpose, I don't see a, a story about an attempted gang rape as being particularly helpful to me as a gay Christian in deciding how to live my life. Mm -hmm. um, so I would make similar cases for the other passages, and I would argue that the overarching theme of scripture in terms of how Jesus and Paul looked at the law and grace, you know, Jesus saying things like, you know, uh, you know, if your child falls into a well on the Sabbath, wouldn't you pull them out, even though the law says not to do work on the Sabbath, that there's this theme of grace trumping law. Now, then you have to, you know, I'm not trying to get into sort of an antinomian argument, and there's, you know, it obviously gets very complicated. I talk about it some in my book. I talk about it on the Gay Christian Network website. Ron and I both have essays where we argue uh, our different scriptural positions, but, but that would be, those would be some of the kinds of things that I, that I would say. Fair enough, okay. Ron. Um, so as I've been sitting here looking like I'm nodding and listening to Justin, my philosopher brain has been running off trying to figure out how to answer this question. So, I, But I don't want to give that long and complex answer that my brain was coming up with. So I want to try to boil it down. Um, so the, the basic Christian belief is that we are persons and our understanding of person comes from the Trinity, that the persons of the Trinity are inherently relationally linked. Um, in contemporary society, um, we're very influenced by Freud, and we think of you know, sex drive, libido, as this, you know, the most basic element of the person. And you know, the, the direction that Freud took it, or the extremes that Freud took it to are not, not everyone accepts it. But there's still, sexuality, sexual intimacy is prized in our culture in a way that goes, I think, way beyond the way it's been in a lot of other cultures. And I think particularly um, if we want to take seriously the idea that celibacy can be, as the New Testament says, an important way of serving God, regardless of what we think about celibacy being just a gift given to some or um, an obligation for people in certain circumstances or whatever, but the idea that celibacy can be um, a great way of serving God suggests that the Christian understanding of what it means to live a fulfilling human life is not as connected with sex as contemporary society thinks. But it is connected with um, being relationally linked. So I think um, to, if I tried to um, just shut myself off from other people, and you know, I see this happen sometimes with people who I think get too focused on, you know, I have to stay away from any situation where I could be tempted in any way. And so I won't have friendships, I'll just, sort of cut myself off, and then in that isolation and loneliness, often temptations get far worse and people end up falling into serious problems. So the short answer that I would give is that I think um, sexual intimacy is not as important for Christian fulfillment as a lot of people think, but connection to other people is an essential aspect of our nature as human beings. 
So we need to, in order for celibacy to be a fulfilling and good way of life, it needs to be connected with connection with other people. And, and, I, and I, I, would just, and I would just say, you know, my position, I would also say that I don't think that sexual intimacy is the critical piece. I would say, for me, allowing people the chance to have romantic intimacy, to fulfill that kind of, you know, God looking at Adam and saying, it's not good that the man should be alone kind of thing, is really critical. And that when we rob people of that, that, that we're doing a, a grave injustice, and if we look at the fruit that's come out of that in the church, I think it's been bad. And so that's, this is part of where Ron and I disagreed, so, you know, but, but, but it's... I'll let him do it this one. But, <laughs> anyway, I, I bring that point up only to say that I think one of the places we agree is that sexual intimacy is not, it's not what it's all about. This is not ultimately an argument about sex. I'm not here saying, yes, we all need to have, you know, more sex, but it, it, <laughs> it's, Ultimately, it's, it's, you know, it, and, and Ron is not against sex, but what Ron is saying is that sex has an appropriate place. And what I'm saying is that I think sex is appropriate in a marriage, and I think marriage uh, is not dependent on gender. I'm intrigued, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, I hope you've gained some understanding here tonight. Yeah, I think that's right. Thank you very much. I think they, will you guys stay and, and chat if, if people want to come of have course. conversations? Of course. Yeah, and I think you I can bring your conversations up. Uh, tomorrow night, Romans 1. And I would also encourage you to read Romans 14. And I'll close with this. Why do we judge your brother and sister? Why do you treat them with contempt? For we will all stand before God's judgment seat. Therefore, stop passing judgment on one another. Go in peace. We'll see you tomorrow night. Thank you.